Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Well, hey, Calvary, happy Tuesday to you. I hope you're having a great day. And uh, we're going to jump back into the book of 1 Samuel in just a minute. But i uh, got a question before we kick off, and that is, have you ever felt compelled to take matters into your own hands? Maybe you were standing by as something was happening. You're like, I can't watch this anymore. Maybe it was at work and some new person or someone in a different department was trying to do something that they couldn't do and you just had to get in there and do it. Maybe it was at home. Maybe your husband has no idea how to load the dishwasher correctly or to, to, to do the laundry or to fold or whatever it might be. Maybe you are like, hey, my wife has no idea how to use the barbecue and to use it properly, so I've got to get in there and get out of the way. I don't know what causes you to feel that way. But today we're going to see in 1 Samuel chapter 13 um, that, that sometimes when we feel the need to take matters into our own hands, it can go pretty sideways, especially as it relates to spiritual things when we say, I'm going to take this into my own hands, what should be gods or one of his representatives. So what's going on here? Well, Saul is now solidified as the king. The people are recognizing him as such. He's had some military battles. And now Israel's kind of preeminent enemy, the Philistines, is at it again. They're causing problems and and they need to go fight them. And so Saul begins to, to gather. He's got his, his kind of baseline army, his, his permanent troops. He calls for more. He's like, we need a lot of troops for this mission. And he calls for them to meet at this place. And whatever, we aren't given the details, but there was some agreement made between Saul and Samuel that they would wait there and that they would offer a sacrifice before the Lord before they went into battle. And they had set a time period. And so Saul is there waiting, troops are there waiting, but they're getting a little restless. Saul is getting a little anxious. And that's where we pick up. 1 Samuel 13, starting in verse 8, says he, that is Saul, waited seven days, the appointed time by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, if you're not familiar with some of the Old Testament uh, customs and religions, there's, there's a series of offerings that would happen. You couldn't just go in and do that. No, just a random person couldn't walk in. You had to be a, a, a priest or a prophet or someone designated by God to carry this out. It wasn't proper or, or lawful before the Lord to just walk in and do this. And yet Saul thought he could just, as the king, walk in and do it. I'm the king. I can do what I want, maybe, is what he's thinking. It says, as soon as he finished the offering, finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. It's awkward. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and I offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you from then For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul decides to take matters into his own hands to offer this offering but did you notice some of the, the, the phrasing that he used there? He, he wasn't there to worship before the Lord. He was there to, to gain some kind of mystical power by doing this religious act to go into battle. It's almost like he saw this as some kind of good luck charm. Well, we've got to go to Gilgal and to do the offering so God gives us favor so we can go win in battle. As if it was just a box to be checked as if it was just some kind of lucky charm that they could accomplish before they went into battle. And this begins the the decline of Saul's leadership over the nation of Israel. You even see it specifically prophesied by Samuel. He says, your kingdom will not continue. Had you obeyed God, had you honored him, had you followed him, 
it would have continued forever, but now God's going to go find someone after his own heart. If you are a student of scripture, you know that that is referring to the king that would come after him, David, who is described in numerous occasions as a man after God's own heart. But all because Saul didn't have a proper understanding of worship. He thought it was just a pawn to be used, a, a thing to be manipulated, and he really didn't care to be obedient to God's timing or ways. And those things cost him his kingdom. It cost him his leadership. It cost him his authority over this. And for us, as we look at this scripture, as we process what does this mean for us, we get the, the painful reminder that eventually God is going to make a decision to not bless actions that don't honor him. God had, God had worked and shown mercy towards the people of Israel when they asked for a king. God had been gracious towards them. God had worked and still provided and been present. But when Saul decided here to just directly disobey and dishonor God, God said, I'm not going to continue to honor that. I wonder how many times we ask God for blessings and we want God to help us and bless us and work in our life while we actively live in rebellion to what he's asking us to do. While we actively live against his desire for how we treat people or how we make decisions or how we use our, our words or, or, or what our life looks like and what our priorities are and we're going against him and expecting him to bless that. And eventually he's going to say, I can't do that. I can't bless what doesn't honor me. And also we see from Saul here that worship or acts of, of religious devotion, they're not pawns to be moved with strategy. They're not things to be manipulated for our gain. He's thinking that he can just go and offer this burnt offering and kind of manipulate that into getting, giving him power in this battle. And that's not what it's about. Worship is not about what we get out of it, but it's about what we can give God and how we can pour back our devotion and our worship and adoration and confession before him. And so today, as you reflect on the sad turn of events in the life of Saul and how his kingdom would now start a downward slope towards uh, dissolution, let me ask you, are you expecting God to bless what doesn't honor him? Are you asking God to bless your life and, and work without honoring and worshiping him first? If so, let me encourage you to go back before God and worship him, not for what you get out of it, not as some transaction, but just to say, I want to follow you and bow before you as the God of the universe. I hope that you'll do that today. We'll see you next time.